I, I always forget to record. So and we will find out that uh, for some equations uh, over the rails or, or so of a higher degree, it's also possible to uh, get a, a solution, a, a, an exact solution uh, by means of, well, uh, in some way of nearing theory. Before we start, uh, we have to work down the easy workload from uh, last time. One question was, how do the polynomials uh, in the a variety of commutative rings, uh, not necessarily with identity, look like? So that was question number 10. We have the variety of all rings, which are commutative. Uh, and uh, when we want to find out how a polynomial, a typical polynomial looks like, we take some uh, ring R in this variety. And uh, when we look at R of X, well, of course, we have the typical polynomials, as you uh, all know. Uh, we have all a sub naught plus a sub one times x plus a sub two times x squared and so on up to some a n x to the n. Uh, but uh, is this all? So uh, did anybody uh, look at this if we have missed some polynomials? Now we don't have the, the, an, an identity as usual. So one polynomial is not uh, is still missing. It's not there. Well, what about the x? Uh, x, uh, if we don't have a one here, uh, one times, uh, we cannot write uh, x as something times x. So uh, we also have to add uh, x, and not only x, but also uh, x plus x, x plus x plus x, and so on. So let's say uh, some uh, set one times x, mm -hmm. where set one is an, uh, an integer. And this is just a declaration for x plus x plus x uh, set one times. But we also have to add uh, set two times x squared because x squared is also not in here. And so uh, the polynomials uh, which we get, uh, they look really strange because uh, that's not the usual form we're used to. Uh, and, but we mustn't forget about uh, these uh, extra polynomials, multi uh, uh, additive, multiples of x, x squared, and so on. But uh, now from that point on, uh, that's it. And what we have here is, uh, again, a normal form, because it's quite easy uh, for a polynomial. If you have parentheses and so on, you multiply until you reach that. Uh, and so it's a nice way to write down all these uh, polynomials uh, over R in this case. The question number 11 uh, was the shape of polynomials over the, uh, in the variety of old Boolean algebras. And uh, of course, we take the Boolean algebras uh, of the type, as we discussed last time, uh, of the type uh, two, two for the uh, cap and cup, uh, zero, zero for the zero and one element, and uh, one for complementation. Yeah, and that's a long story, which you had uh, met before many times because uh, what one gets are the typical polynomials uh, over Boolean algebras. 
uh, and uh, you know that one can bring them, for instance, in into the uh, disjunctive normal form. Uh, and or the conjunctive normal form, and they are normal forms, as the name says, uh, and they are real normal forms, not just uh, systems of representatives, because uh, for these one can uh, has a nice procedure, uh, starting from an arbitrary polynomial uh, with many x and and so on, uh, to reduce it to a disjunctive normal form. So uh, let's uh, continue perhaps, uh, and we uh, now want to find out what we can say about the ideals in polynomial nearings. So uh, let's take the case uh, C1 of all commutative rings with identity. And in there, uh, we take uh, a ring R out of that and look for the uh, ideals. But now we have uh, an, an interesting situation. Uh, if R is an element of that, we have R of X with the usual addition, the multiplication And we have composition as well. So here we have uh, more uh, than the usual two operations. We have uh, three binary operations there. And so uh, one can study all uh, three together. And then it's called the so-called composition ring. Uh, The old name is three operational algebra, which is also self-explaining. And uh, so we uh, can study this, but in most cases, it uh, suffices to study uh, plus and composition alone. And uh, then we are in a uh, nearing situation and we might be interested uh, if we take the nearing or if we take the ring situation, uh, what is the relation between the ideals? Uh, the ideals in this case here, uh, they must be ideals both for the ring and for the nearing case. And uh, so they are called full ideals sometimes. What one can say is, uh, and this will become uh, question number 12, so, that every ideal in uh, R of X up, so in the ring case uh, is automatically a left ideal in the nearing R of X plus composition. So uh, the ideals pretty much correspond to each other and uh, everything you need uh, for an ideal here is to look at the uh, closure from the right uh, side. A nice result is this. Uh, if we start with a field f, and if this is infinite, then this nearing f of x plus composition uh, is simple. So in fact, uh, in the infinite case, we do not uh, uh, get ideals here. And uh, this is a result, uh, old result due to uh, Strauss. 
think it was just one. Yes, yeah. Uh, Stas was an interesting and very versatile uh, mathematician. He also uh, worked together with Einstein for quite a while. And uh, the proof is not uh, too difficult, but rather lengthy. Now, this is an, uh, also an interesting situation because uh, we can be proud uh, to have a result like this. Uh, this nearing is simple and we should be happy. On the other hand, uh, it uh, uh, avoids an application uh, which is true for the uh, ring case when here is multiplication because uh, there you have a lot of ideals, principal ideals, and if you factor out them, uh, then uh, you can uh, use this for simultaneous computations uh, because you can uh, replace f of x uh, by uh, f of x factored by a very high de degree polynomial. And this uh, can be decomposed into simple uh, factors. And you can do the computations instead of uh, uh, polynomials uh, with a high degree, you can uh, do it with polynomials of degree one or two simultaneously in all components. Now that uh, uh, might indicate that we can get uh, perhaps a little bit around this uh, barrier that uh, uh, equations of the higher order, uh, five and, and higher, uh, cannot be uh, solved by uh, radicals, as uh, you all know. And uh, there would be an idea, uh, if we can decompose this, then we can also work with polynomials of smaller degree, and then uh, maybe collect the uh, various solutions in the components to a total solution for a high degree polynomial. Yeah, but uh, this avoids uh, this uh, method because here we have, uh, because it's simple, we cannot do this with respect to com uh, with respect to composition. And uh, the composition is around here because when you have a polynomial F uh, and if you insert a certain element R of the ring, then this is just the same as F composed with R, where R is, uh, taking as the, the polynomial, the constant polynomial with value r. And uh, so uh, in order to uh, use this uh, for uh, equations of the high order, uh, you would have uh, to have the, also the uh, thing that uh, these ideals are also ideals with respect to compositions. That means that they are full ideals, but we do not have this and also the techniques of the uh, fast Fourier transform, uh, they uh, are not uh, available here in the uh, case of polynomial nearings. But uh, there's uh, some hope and we can uh, bring some uh, improvement to this in the following sense. A topic for polynomials in the polynomial ring case is always the decomposition of the, uh, the factorization of polynomials into irreducible factors. And we might ask if uh, something like that is also available here. So uh, the question might be, if you start with a polynomial, uh, uh, can you uh, decompose it in some way so that a polynomial f uh, can be decomposed into, say, f1, f2, fr? Not with respect to multiplication, but with respect to composition. And uh, the question is, uh, is it possible? And we, of course, we we'll, would like to uh, do this as long 
as we still can decompose uh, some of these called factors. Uh, and uh, so these, we want these F sub i's to be uh, indecomposable. Is this possible? Uh, how? And is this, uh, is this useful? Is it unique? The usual questions we have uh, in the case of factorization of polynomials. So factorization means uh, factorization with respect to multiplication. Uh, composition or decomposition means uh, with respect to composition. Now, in the, uh, the first part is pretty easy uh, because uh, we can say uh, if R has no zero divisors, then, uh, you know, it's very easy to see that the degree of F composed to G is simply the degree of F times the degree of G. So uh, now you can argue in the following way. Suppose you start with a polynomial F, maybe for a higher degree, uh, then uh, it can be decomposable or it can be indecomposable. If it's indecomposable, uh, we are done. If it can be decomposed, uh, then we uh, decompose it. And then we do the same for F1 and F2 and go on as long as we can still decompose. And so the existence of such a decomposition uh, is clear because uh, the degrees of F1, F2 and so on, uh, the degrees uh, go down pretty fast uh, and uh, we have to stop uh, eventually at some point. Uh, so the existence is pretty easy. Uh, if R is an uh, integral domain, if it has no zero divisors, then the existence is uh, uh, more or less, yeah, not trivial, but uh, more or less easy. What about the uniqueness? The uniqueness uh, also holds, and that's a result of Lebar. I uh, write it in this way, the decomposition is essentially unique. unique. That means essentially unique. Well, uh, there are some things which you can uh, still do here in this case. For instance, if you have uh, F1 composed with F2, uh, you can also write it as F1 composed with say X plus five, composed with X minus five, composed with F2. And so you have four, uh, decomposition parts, but these two uh, cancel because uh, these are units here. Uh, and so you have to ex exclude this. And you also have uh, to take care of uh, commutativity conditions here. Sometimes uh, the composition of two polynomials commutes uh, and this is rather uh, rare, but uh, uh, we have two collections which uh, have the proper uh, property that all members of this collection uh, commute with respect to composition. The one is the uh, x, x squared, x to the third, and so on. Obviously, uh, they commute with respect to composition and they form the so-called power chain.
And uh, then there's another uh, type of polynomials, of a collection of polynomials, call them uh, T1, T2, T3. And that's the uh, Chebyshev chain. These are uh, so-called uh, Chebyshev polynomials, and they are uh, uh, defined in such a way. Well, T sub one, T sub naught is equal to one. T sub uh, one is equal to x, and uh, T sub n plus one is equal to 2x tn. Plus tn minus one. And so the next uh, t2 would be 2x squared minus one and so on. Uh, and uh, Milbar proved that this uh, decomposition is unique. That's a very, very long proof. It goes uh, for about uh, 40 pages. And uh, uh, he took care of these exceptions uh, that one can have uh, uh, power chains or yeah. Chebyshev chains, and they uh, destroy in some way their uniqueness, uh, but only in some way. Now, uh, the next thing is, uh, if it's uh, such a decomposition exists and if it's unique, uh, is it very hard to decompose? And uh, in fact, uh, there were uh, hopes that one could use this uh, for uh, things like uh, uh, cryptology because uh, the most common cryptology system now uh, is uh, of the uh, RS8 procedure where you use a, a number, big number n, uh, and in order to decode uh, uh, the message, you would have to factor n. And uh, if n is small, that's very easy. But if n uh, has, say, about 200 digits, then uh, it, it takes uh, many millions of years to decompose uh, this into two primes. Uh, one can also do this instead of uh, natural numbers of by polynomials. And uh, the uh, property is, or the question is, if you want to decode the message, you have to uh, factor the polynomial of a high degree. Uh, and some investigations were done in this area. And then there was the hope uh, if we use decomposition instead of, uh, of multiplication, then decomposition decomp looks uh, more complicated. And so this would be even much better for uh, cryptology. Uh, but then uh, it turned out that this is not the case. Uh, and the decomposition is remarkably easy. Uh, it uh, runs... Uh, in time uh, n, it's, it's of order uh, n log n. So it's computationally uh, not not quite linear, but uh, it's uh, very close to be uh, linear, and it reduces to uh, a system of linear equations, uh, more or less, and uh, so the decomposition goes easy. Uh, is it useful to have composition, decomposition? Uh, yes, we uh, can perhaps look at this.
let's have a look at a, a very a simple uh, problem, namely uh, x to the fourth minus five x squared plus six is equal to zero. Now, of course, uh, that's a, a equation of degree four, usually hard to solve, but uh, we all know how to overcome this. Uh, we simply say uh, we take uh, uh, x squared and call this y. Then we have y squared minus 5y plus 6 is 0. We solve this. There are two solutions. Uh, I've did, uh, done it first. Uh, it's 2 and 3. And then you remember that uh, y is the same as x squared. So you have now x squared is equal to 2, and x squared is equal to 3. And so you get uh, solutions out of that uh, in a very easy way. You have uh, x1 and x2. These are plus minus the root of 2. And x3 and x4 are plus minus the root of 3. Of course, uh, this only works here because the uh, equation is so simple, and one can see from uh, one can see immediately that uh, this is an equation not in x but in x squared. You can also uh, say this polynomial here is the same as x squared minus 5x plus uh, 6. And we compose it with x squared. And so we see that uh, we can take this polynomial and decompose it uh, into two polynomials of degree uh, 2 each. And uh, what we did uh, then was we solved this equal to 0 first. And for each solution, uh, 2 and 3, we uh, solve x squared is equal to 2 or 3. Now, as I said, this is a very uh, special topic, a very uh, special equation. But what about uh, a more difficult one? I. Uh, didn't want to compute so much, so I let it be done. Here it is. Uh, so can you see this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So we have a, a, an equation of degree eight, uh, and here. Uh, we have all powers present, and it's not quite clear uh, how we can do this uh, in, uh, uh, in the same way. But uh, what we can do is to do the following. Uh, we take this, I hope it's not too small to read. Uh, we can decompose this polynomial, uh, and the command uh, in, that's in Mathematica is simply decompose. And here the polynomial, and here the uh, the what the variable uh, is the name of the variable x. Uh, of course, we know it's not a variable, uh, and so uh, it goes uh, quite fast. No, but it yeah it goes quite fast. Uh, That. Okay, uh, and here it is. Uh, these are the. Uh, is it is it too uh, too, uh, too too small no, to read? Okay. Yeah. It, no. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, fine. So you see the. Uh, this polynomial of degree 8 uh, above is 20 minus 9x plus x squared 
composed with minus six x uh, plus x squared, and this uh, composed with x plus x squared again. And so uh, what we do uh, is to solve the first equation here is to equal to zero. Uh, that should be uh, easy to do so, uh, but I'm too lazy to do this. Let me put it down here. No. Excuse me. No. Let's copy. Whatever can go wrong <laughs> does go wrong. So now we are done. We can uh, let it be solved. And the solutions are uh, four x to, uh, equal to four, x equal to five. And now we take the uh, second part of our decomposition. Uh, this is minus six, six x plus x squared. And we take this here. Um, syntax asks for uh, Four, four is the first one. So we get uh, so we get these uh, the first of these two solutions, and uh, we can uh, do it in the same way as above here, and solve. This equal to five now. No. And we get similar solutions. And then for each of those four, we have to uh, do it again for the third component, which is x plus x squared. Uh, and yeah, to uh, find the solutions here, I do it for the first uh, thing. Uh, and so we get these two solutions and the same for the others. Uh, and so we uh, can get down to uh, polynomials. Uh, we can down uh, to all these uh, cases and we get all eight solutions of this uh, equation up, up there. And we get exact solutions, which is sometimes uh, very nice and uh, comfortable because uh, when you, for instance, uh, look for uh, eigenvalues, uh, then uh, a value which is close to an eigenvalue is not an eigenvalue anymore, and it has no eigenvectors. Uh, and so one should be, uh, one should get precise 
solutions. Uh, by the way, we might also uh, try uh, to say uh, to Mathematica, uh, uh, we don't want to do all this, uh, simply solve this equation here and uh, we'll, uh, let's see what, what it uh, will do. Okay, uh, you see uh, in a tick of a second, uh, Mathematica has solved this equation of degree eight in and got the same solutions as we uh, uh, got. But uh, this is not a, a very big surprise because when you tell Mathematica also Maple and other systems to solve uh, equations of a higher degree, they first try to decompose the polynomial uh, in exactly in the same way as we did here. But uh, you see that it's basically a nearing technique because it happens in the nearing of polynomials. Now uh, that would be wonderful if uh, we can do it for every equation of this type. And uh, on the other hand, uh, it's uh, clear that some uh, polynomials will not be decomposable uh, anymore. So I think I can better. Uh, switch to the uh, old game. Uh, what happens if, say, a polynomial uh, f has a degree, say, 7? Can it be decomposable? No, because the, uh, the parts in the decomposition uh, have degrees which multiply together uh, to seven, and that's uh, hardly possible uh, for a prime number. Uh, and so we can easily uh, immediately see that if degree f uh, is a prime, then f is indecomposable. And there do exist other polynomials as well, which are indecomposable, but not of prime degree. So uh, there is a, num a large number of polynomials which is decomposable in the large number of polynomials, which is not. But it's a, a very interesting thing because uh, here with this decomposition, we can uh, really uh, do something useful for equations of higher order, which we cannot uh, get a hold on otherwise. Yeah, let's have another look at polynomial uh, nearings. And now perhaps uh, in the case of groups. So now let's work in the class of groups, in the variety of all groups. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are uh, some results, maybe one, every normal subgroup uh, of G of X G is a group, uh, is automatically a left ideal uh, in G, G of X plus composition. So again, the ideal structures, uh, so to speak, uh, correspond to a uh, large extent. Another uh, fact about uh, G of X is that we can take a G naught of X uh, and determine that uh, 
Now G naught of X uh, is uh, the set of all polynomials over a group such that uh, these are zero symmetric. Uh, that means if you insert uh, uh, X equal to zero here, then uh, it should be zero. Let's try to find out what it means. That's the set of all polynomials. We know they are look, look like this. G1 plus Z1 times X plus G2 uh, plus uh, Z2 times X up to Zn times X plus Gn. Such that. And now uh, what happens if we insert uh, zero for X, we get simply G1 plus G2 uh, plus G3 and so on, just the sum of the of the constants here, uh, so that uh, the sum G naught or G naught here, plus G1 plus G sub n is equal to zero. Uh, so it's uh, simply to determine the zero symmetric part. And this has an interesting uh, consequence, uh, which will meet in one of the later lectures. What about uh, the uh, ideal structure uh, of G of X? And here there's uh, a very interesting result. Maybe. In the result uh, by Carol Tooley, G of X is never simple. I uh, studied together with Harold Tooley and he uh, was quite impressive because uh, he got his uh, topic for his dissertation. And for about two years, he didn't sh uh, tell the supervisor Neubauer anything about the, what he has done. So after a while, uh, Neubauer got uh, a bit angry and said to him, well, write down what you have done so far. And uh, Hule uh, sat down for uh, three days and two nights and wrote the whole dissertation in one piece uh, out of his head. He had ever no notes or so. He had everything in his head. And this is one of the results there. The proof is quite uh, nice because uh, uh, first of all, uh, let G Uh, have at least two elements. And then we take G in G, G not zero, that ex exists in this uh, case. And then we uh, take an interesting homomorphism, uh, H, going from G of X, to the integers modular two in such a way uh, that uh, we uh, take uh, the polynomial as we had before, G naught plus C one X and so on. And that uh, is mapped into the sum of the, now of, of the integers, Z one plus Z two and so on times one. So uh, in Z2, so it means uh, it, if the sum of the sets uh, is even or odd, it will be uh, one, uh, zero or one. That turns out to be uh, a nearing apimorphism. Z2 uh, is a field that, uh, but, uh, and hence also a nearing. So uh, it's a nearing apimorphism. And uh, what about the kernel? The kernel must be must uh, be in, in, uh, an ideal in G of X. And uh, yeah, G 
So we can say if g of x is simple, then uh, the kernel must be trivial. And so the, uh, it must be an isomorphism. But if it's an isomorphism, uh, that cannot really be because uh, g of x is infinite. Uh, you have infinitely many polynomials uh, and C2 is very finite. Uh, and so we cannot have an, uh, an isomorphism there. Uh, second case, what if this G consists of just one element? Well, G, then G of X we only have the neutral element here. So uh, this is just the set of all uh, set times X, set and set. And so uh, it's isomorphic uh, to uh, the integers and tens. It's also not simple. Uh, and so in, in both cases, uh, we get uh, this result here. Uh, maybe question number 13. Uh, if we take the case of abelian groups, uh, and can we transfer this uh, proof to the case that uh, of A of X? So can we find out if this A of X is all, also simple, simple? Now the polynomials have a much easier uh, shape, you know, uh, and so it doesn't automatically uh, carry over. Yeah, uh, pretty much uh, is still unknown in the case of polynomials over groups. Uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, we had this uh, homomorphism last time from polynomials to polynomial. No, that that's that comes later. Excuse me. Okay, so uh, that's a remarkable result uh, for. Uh, polynomials over groups, perhaps, uh, and maybe we we look at another uh, case uh, in the case of n. all nearings, how do the polynomials look like there? So we take a nearing n and take n of x. This will again lead us uh, to a nearing of polynomials, uh, but uh, what would be typical elements in n of x? Now we, of course we have the the uh, n uh, elements of n, we have multiples of uh, n0 plus n1 times x plus n2 times x squared and so on. But then we also uh, have things like uh, n maybe 8 uh, times uh, x squared composed uh, with uh, x plus one uh, and then composed with uh, x squared plus three uh, uh, yeah three times x or so and now you see uh, in contrast to the uh, situation we have in rings where we can multiply all these uh, parentheses in the case of nearings, we cannot do this anymore. Uh, well, we could do uh, something with this here, uh, but uh, on the other hand, 
uh, as long as you have parentheses on the right hand side, uh, you will not be able to uh, do this. And so uh, the shape of polynomials in the case of nearings, so nearings over poly uh, polynomials over nearings, uh, the shape of these polynomials uh, can be really uh, yeah, complicated or involved and And so in this case, uh, you cannot really say that you have uh, a normal form, uh, not even a system of representatives, uh, which, which is nice. Uh, you know that a system of representative exists, but uh, nobody knows how it really looks like. Maybe one could uh, find uh, a complicated way to uh, bring this into a normal form, but uh, this is, seems to be rather hopeless and the result would be very complicated at the end. So now we have a, a case where we uh, have a variety uh, where the polynomials do not have a nice normal form, and that can happen, of course, as well. Maybe a quick word uh, to uh, one topic. Uh, I also, I always had in the last uh, time x equal to x, so we have polynomials uh, in, as it's sometimes well, mostly called one variable, which is not a variable, but let's uh, stay with this a name. Uh, let's be forgiving. And then in this case, uh, we might ask what happens if we have uh, two or more variables? Uh, so if X is equal to X1, X2, what about composition there? And now uh, the composition of polynomials and polynomial functions is uh, not quite uh, trivial. It's a bit involved because uh, if you have a polynomial functions, for instance, f of in x1 and x2, and if you compose it with another g of x1, x2, it's not quite clear if you what would you replace x1 by the whole thing here or by something else and whatever x2. And so there are uh, quite a number of attempts uh, made to make this uh, into an earring. There exist several ways to uh, get an earring out of this. And uh, depending on which way you uh, take, you will get. Uh, of course, uh, uh, different types of uh, polynomial uh, polynomials or polynomial functions. Yeah, the, uh, I mentioned polynomial functions already, so let's go to chapter six now. Polynomial functions. And if I may recall uh, that in the case of uh, words, we had the words and uh, if they are applied to some algebra in this variety, uh, then they will yield uh, indu induced word functions. But the same uh, can take place here uh, with polynomials. So let's take a variety V of expanded groups, but not necessarily for the, for the next thing. Uh, and let's take an algebra A in this variety and uh, take again uh, X to be consisting of small X alone. And uh, we form the polynomial algebra again A V of X. And if you take a polynomial P out of that, you uh, again get uh, 
is a corresponding function because a polynomial, as you uh, might recall, uh, this is also a special type of words, namely uh, words uh, where we have put all the unary operations, uh, uh, fix fixing elements of A uh, to the uh, set of operations. And so this uh, induces a function P squared on A going from A to A in the same way as we did it for words the uh, elements x are replaced by elements of uh, a, and uh, uh, the collection of all these polynomial functions of p of a uh, of a, such that p is in a p of x, Let's call this P sub A. And this is a, a again, a nice nearing, the nearing of polynomial functions. And uh, of course, we can also study P sub not of A, the zero symmetric part, the constant part. And uh, so this is a nice nearing, and this is a sub nearing of M of A, which is the set of all maps from A to A, the set of all self maps on A. Now uh, we might ask, do there exist algebras where all functions are polynomial functions? Uh, if we look back at the case of real numbers, we know that there are a number of uh, functions which are not polynomial functions, uh, but uh, there exist cases where we uh, really have this nice situation and uh, maybe you uh, recall that in the case of Boolean algebras, every function from the from 0, 1 to the n uh, to 0, 1 is in fact a, a Boolean polynomial function which makes things very nice there. It's uh, easy to see uh, that uh, P of A is generated by the identity function and all constant functions. Generated means it's a sub nearing generated of, uh, in M of A by the identity and all constant functions. Well, uh, the polynomials are generated by X and the symbols for the uh, constant functions. And so if you uh, take this down to functions, uh, you get uh, this result. That means for polynomial functions, we wouldn't have uh, had to take this long way uh, to universal algebra to get a nice definition because that's that's very easy. You take an algebra A, you take uh, all constant functions uh, and the identity function, and then uh, you take the smallest sub in uh, M of A, which contains them. And this is uh, these are just the polynomial functions. So polynomial functions are much easier to define and uh, we should perhaps uh, uh, remark that uh, a uh, v of x depends on, of course, the algebra a with the operations and on the variety V, we have seen if we change the variety, uh, then the polynomials will get uh, a different shape. And so it heavily depends on the variety you're working at or you, which you have selected. Uh, but uh, P of A, you see there's no V in here, 
it of course depends on a on the algebra and not uh, on the variety uh, because uh, this has nothing to do with the variety. We just uh, have an algebra A and can form uh, all polynomial functions on A. And so these, uh, these concepts are uh, pretty diff diff different. Uh, although uh, we have an, uh, an obvious connection between uh, both of them and we uh, will investigate this connection uh, now. And so uh, maybe this should have a warning sign. Uh, this fact is pretty much overlooked uh, in many cases that polynomials and polynomial functions are not similar. Uh, they are even uh, have a completely different construction. Fact. Uh, all of what we uh, have had so far, namely a v of x, uh, then uh, also p of a, of course p naught of a, p c of a, m of a, Uh, all nearings. So all these interesting things which we have here uh, form nearings with respect to the addition which we have in A because we have a variety of expanded groups. Uh, so addition and composition. And then the map H going from AV of X into P of A, ending each polynomial P to the induced polynomial function on A. This turns out to be a very nice nearing homomorphism. In fact, it's a nearing epimorphism. But uh, uh, we might uh, question, is it uh, an epimorphism or is it even an isomorphism? Now, uh, isomorphism cannot be all the, all the time because uh, look at this. Suppose A is finite, then P of A is finite because there are only finitely many functions from A to A, but A V of X is always infinite. And so uh, in the infinite case, you cannot have an isomorphism here and we must be careful. Uh, and so it's a, a good idea to distinguish between polynomials and polynomial functions uh, because uh, otherwise uh, one easily gets mixed up. So the question is, uh, is this an isomorphism? Or when is it an isomorphism? Uh, and let's look at the familiar case of commutative rings with identity again. Suppose we have an uh, isomorphism then uh, yeah, uh, this, this is not quite uh, trivial because uh, what is the equality here uh, in the polynomials? The equality is 
two polynomials are equal if they have the same degree and if they have the same coefficients. So you can uh, decide the equality of two polynomials easily by looking at the coefficients. And so that's the uh, so-called principle of uh, comparing coefficients. Uh, but whenever you hear the word principle, uh, it's uh, perhaps a little bit uh, dangerous because in mathematics we have axioms, we have definitions, theorems, but we don't have uh, principles. So <laughs> you might laugh, but uh, it means that uh, mathematicians uh, do not have principles. Uh, okay, uh, and so uh, and the thing with the principle is uh, dangerous, and you can see why. The equality here is something completely different. Two functions are the same uh, if they uh, coincide on every value, uh, small a from capital A. And so there's two different uh, equality uh, concepts uh, might not uh, coincide and do not coincide mostly, uh, but they are often uh, confused. So what we are now interested in is what is the, what can we say about the kernel of H? Is it, if it's zero, we have an isomorphism. If not, uh, we just have an abimorphism and that's it. Let's do the uh, easiest case uh, first, perhaps uh, take uh, an, uh, a field. So the proposition would be F a field. which is a member of the class of commutative rings with identity. And uh, we can say uh, H is an isomorphism if and only if F is infinite. Uh, the proof is pretty easy. If F is finite, then we have seen before, uh, it cannot be an isomorphism because then P of F uh, would be finite, this would be infinite. And so we get immediately a contradiction. What if F is, in, is infinite? Take a polynomial in the kernel of uh, H. Uh, and P not equal to zero. Suppose something like that would uh, hold. What does it mean? It means the corresponding polynomial function here uh, has is zero all the time. Uh, so it's zero for every value of f. And so uh, this polynomial would have infinitely many zeros, which uh, cannot happen because a polynomial or a field, you know, has at most uh, as many zeros as it uh, has uh, as its degree. So uh, p has infinitely many zeros, which is also uh, a contradiction. <clears throat> now that's the reason why uh, we have learned in high school uh, that we can identify polynomials and polynomial functions, because uh, in this case, uh, we always work <laughs> Excuse me. We always work 
over the real numbers, which is an infinite field. And so in this case, uh, H is an isomorphism. <coughs> and uh, that means that we can identify polynomials and polynomial functions. And from this uh, uh, point of, of view, uh, many people think that uh, that's the, really the same. Okay, so uh, in the case of the field, it's, we have a clear uh, picture of what uh, H is, if it's an isomorphism or not. It also means that uh, for uh, the real numbers, we have something very convenient. If f of x is the function, say, 3 minus 5x squared plus x to the third, and g of x is uh, 5 minus x plus 2x to the third, we can immediately say uh, that uh, these two functions are not the same. They could be the same uh, uh, in principle because uh, it might just be that these two things are always the same. But uh, since we can identify polynomials and polynomial functions, we can use this so-called principle of uh, coefficients, uh, comparing coefficients and see that uh, f uh, is not the same as g. However, we will meet cases uh, for in the finite case where this uh, cannot be said, and uh, that uh, comes uh, in a few minutes. So, what happens uh, now if f uh, is not a field? When is the map h? which takes every polynomial to the corresponding polynomial function, when is this an isomorphism and when not? So uh, there's a nice theorem, which goes back to Hassel in Hungary. Uh, and it says that if you work in the uh, variety of commutative rings with identity, so uh, C1, then you can see if R plus the additive group of R is torsion free, then uh, H is an isomorphism. So it has to do with the uh, additive group of the ring which is quite interesting and surprising. Uh, and uh, we uh, can have a look at this, why this is the case. The proof is not uh, difficult, but uh, quite nice, I think. Uh, let P, uh, the polynomial be in the kernel of H and not zero. And P, let's call it some a i x to the i is in the kernel of h in p not zero and of minimal degree with these properties. So we take uh, uh, in the uh, kernel of H, if the kernel of H is not zero, uh, otherwise we would be uh, done already. If the kernel of H is not zero, we take the polynomial uh, or one polynomial of minimal degree, which is not zero. It must exist then. And then we 
take the following break. We insert x plus one and subtract uh, p from that. And if we look at this, we get a sub naught plus a sub one times x plus one plus a sub two times x plus one squared and so on up to a sub n x plus one n and then minus a sub naught minus a sub uh, one times x minus up to minus a sub n x to the n. Now we don't have to work it out uh, in detail what's, what's here. Uh, we look at the, just the highest uh, coefficients uh, in uh, the uh, coefficient n. On, on this, we never get up to x to the n uh, until the last uh, term. And we get uh, a sub n. Uh, x to the n, and then uh, some ends of smaller degrees, and we subtract this here, and we get again uh, a sub n, x to the n, and so we get, uh, for the coefficient n, we get uh, exactly zero out of this, and so we look at the coefficient uh, n minus one, It's nothing here. Uh, here we get uh, two times n minus one. We get a sub n minus one times x to the n minus one from the last uh, parenthesis part one. And then we get uh, n minus one here. If we work it out by the binomial formula uh, plus n times a sub n, uh, times x to the n minus one. And then smaller degrees. And here we get x to the n minus one again on the uh, last place but one minus a sub n minus one, x to the n minus one. And so we see uh, that uh, these simply uh, vanish now. And uh, all what remains is just n times a n x to the n minus one. And so we see now uh, what's happening. If you take this polynomial here, uh, then the whole polynomial here is again in the kernel, because if you insert an element R here, you get uh, zero here. And since uh, P of R plus one here, which is also zero because it's all zero all the time. So this is a polynomial in the kernel, not zero, uh, because N times A sub N is not zero because uh, the additive group is torsion free. Here uh, we need this uh, assumption. And it has a smaller degree, it has degree n minus one. And so we get a contradiction to the uh, case that uh, the kernel has uh, a polynomial unequal to zero. A pretty nice argument. Uh, and uh, and uh, so we see uh, the situation is interesting in the following sense. In order to find out where the border is between isomorphism and not isomorphism or between the possibility to identify polynomials and polynomial functions and not. So for fields, 
this situation would be here. Let's do a dividing line here. Here uh, are the infinite fields, and here are the finite fields. And the distinction, if uh, H is an isomorphism, is precisely this line here. So here, uh, the H is an isomorphism, and here H is not an isomorphism. The situation is more in, uh, complicated in the case of a community frames with identity. We again have uh, the infinite case and here the finite case. But uh, the dividing line uh, is not the same as in here. It's maybe up here. And here we have another section, uh, namely uh, torsion free. And so the dividing line is somewhere above. There exists uh, also cases, uh, for instance, where the additive group is not torsion free and where uh, the H is still an isomorphism. And interesting enough, nobody knows where this borderline here really is. What uh, uh, do you have to ask for a ring in order to uh, ensure that you can identify polynomials and polynomial functions? Uh, there were done a few attempts to uh, get closer to this line, but nobody yet uh, has found the, uh, the, the exact uh, situation uh, of this boundary. And maybe another uh, result concerning polynomial functions on uh, rings. So we're still in the variety of commutative rings with identity. Uh, a nice result is a theorem by Neubauer. Uh, saying that the polynomial functions on R is a simple nearing And on the uh, R is a field, except a field, but not C2. So precisely for fields, uh, the polynomial functions do form a simple nearing, uh, and so one gets interesting and non trivial cases of simple nearing series as well. And uh, we just have to exclude the two element field. And this is question number 14. Find an ideal. In B of Z2. So uh, that's a case of polynomial functions 
uh, in the variety of community things with identity. And uh, maybe it's not a good idea to start a game with the next variety, the variety of groups. We also will have a look at the uh, polynomial functions uh, over groups. And uh, also we'll find uh, a nice application of the concept of polynomial functions over uh, expanded groups uh, in, in general uh, to, in order to determine the generated ideals in all uh, types of expanded groups. And this is a nice uh, result, which gives uh, in some way, where well, nearing theory uh, is giving back something to universal algebra uh, and universal algebra gave a lot of things to nearing theory. So uh, I don't want to uh, start with the case of groups now. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for coming again and uh, hope I'll see you again next week. Uh, and as usual, stay healthy. Bye-bye. Okay. See you. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.